Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, the one you will hear doing most of the talking this episode. I'm Katie, and I'm going to be snarky when I can, but there are no movie scenes for me to talk about. You're going to read half the summary for me, too. It's a long one. (laughs) That's what she said. Let's just keep rolling. Fine. Last week, we covered the second half of chapter 35 and the corresponding film scenes. Harry is asked to hold out his arm for God only knows what reason. Crazy David Tennant wants to show us something. Snape and McGonagall ask no questions when given some otherwise questionable tasks. Russian nesting trunks sound more useful than they actually are. Dumbledore may say he has no time for heroes, but the last three years would beg to differ. And the movie skipped the trip to the Department of Backstory that would have answered any and all remaining questions, because fuck you, that's why. During episode 111, Moody Poppins, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts about how the movie did not explain Barty Crouch Jr.'s backstory leading up to this point, like at all? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter Pondering Highly Anticipated Rant. I have been waiting for this here part and this here chapter ever since you started this book. But before we get into that negativity, I got a Salt Bay amount of positivity. Just a sprinkle. Katie, thank you so much for that description of Snape's inner monologue. Something I didn't know I needed until you gave it to me. And now I feel better on the inside. I think I can sleep better at night knowing that's how he felt when he looked into his eyes. Wasn't much of shit, but it was perfect. It was perfect. Second sprinkle of positivity, if you want to call it that. I don't care how much I despise gangster Dumbledore. I don't like him because Dumbledore ain't gangster. But when he blam through that room, okay, and caught Bartimius Jr. by the throat and held the wand sideways like the blinky boy. I felt it in my soul. Somebody needed to jack his ass up a time or two. Somebody needed to, because he thought he was all that. He thought he was the most faithful. Most faithful what? Most faithful biatch. Got your throat wrapped in this old man hand. What you got to say about that? And now we're diving head first into that negativity because I can sleep better at night if I trick my brain into thinking that the only reason J.R. Crouch couldn't give his monologue is because Dumbledore had him by the throat. He stifled him. He couldn't say a goddamn thing because you know what? I don't even want to hear it without Winky whining, crying, bitching and moaning in the background. There is no point of hearing anything he has to say without the existence of the house elf. Because you know what? They would have to lie some more to make it even make sense without Winky. Oh my gosh, they omitted so much from the beginning of the story that they just started to make shit up. Make it make sense. This is not the same goddamn story. Without Ludo Bagman, Winky... Dobby ain't say shit about Sirius and he was there. Nothing really happened that happened in the book. They made shit up. They turned the plot twist of the century into a lip lickathon. Make it make sense. I don't understand. It aggravates me so much because this is my favorite book and they literally scooped out all the pieces, didn't even cut their damn hair and replaced it. With the high price dragon scene that ain't nobody asked for and the shit ain't even happy. But you know what? I'm going to take my L. I'm going to take my L and just let myself be soothed to sleep by Dumbledore's old man hand wrapped around his throat. Because that's the only reason he could not give the monologue to the plot twists of the century. And I'm going to give somebody else the floor because this is starting to get a little emotional for me. Hey Ellen. Hey Katie. So, 
what are my thoughts on how the movie did not have Barney Crouch Jr.'s backstory leading up to this point? Yeah, I think that uh, there's really only one word that can sum that up. Newell. Oh, God. You know, this movie has really just caused nothing but rants. Just nothing but rants about how it completely mucked up the plot. Seriously. I mean, Crouch's backstory explains so much of everything that's happened in the book. It ties everything together. Bertha Jorkins, Wormtail, Voldemort's return. It's just frustrating. It really is. God damn you, Newell. Hi, friends. It's Juliana with this week's Potter Pondering. As far as Barty Crouch Jr.'s backstory, that's my favorite part of this part of the book. Like, it adds so much depth to all of the characters. That is why I love this series. And with the movie not explaining any of it, it reduces his genius down to just being a stereotypical villain. It feels very unresolved as well. And... Please don't misunderstand me. I love David Tennant. But my thought of Barty Crouch Jr. is more Norman Bates and how he's absolutely genius, but in a subtle way, not as over the top as David Tennant portrayed it. So, yeah. Bye, friends. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what color is the sleep potion that Harry is given in the hospital wing? Madame Pomfrey gives Harry a purple potion, telling him he needs to drink all of it for a dreamless sleep. Congratulations goes to Sarah Baines Miller. Woohoo! She finally caught up with all of the episodes, and this is the first time she's ever listened in real time and been able to answer the trivia question. So congratulations, it's awesome that you got there. Maybe you'll get this week too and start up a streak. We shall see. For now, let's just keep rolling into Chapter 36, The Parting of Ways, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 36, The Parting of Ways Dumbledore stands and gives Barty Crouch a look of disgust before raising his wand and sending out ropes to bind him. He asks Minerva to stand guard while he takes Harry upstairs, and she agrees, steadily pointing her wand at the man, though looking slightly nauseous. Dumbledore also asks Severus to tell Madame Pomfrey to come down and help Alistair Moody to the hospital wing, then to find Cornelius Fudge so he can question Crouch himself. Once Snape is gone, Dumbledore asks Harry to come up to his office, letting him know that Sirius is waiting there for him. Harry nods, feeling numb, but also relieved for it, since he doesn't want to examine the memories of everything that just happened, that keep flashing across his mind. Mad-Eye Moody in the trunk, Wormtail cradling the bloody stump of his arm, Voldemort rising out of the cauldron, Cedric, dead, asking to be brought back to his parents. He asks Dumbledore where Cedric's parents are, and the headmaster informs him that they are with Professor Sprout, who knew Cedric best. They reach the stone gargoyle, which springs aside when Dumbledore gives the password, and the two head up the moving spiral staircase to the oak door. When Dumbledore opens the door, Sirius sweeps across the room and asks Harry if he's all right and what happened. Dumbledore fills him in on what Crouch told them, as Harry sits in silence, only half listening. Fox flutters down and lands on Harry's knee, and when Harry greets the phoenix, Dumbledore stops talking and sits down opposite Harry at his desk. Harry avoids his eyes, knowing that he's going to question him and make him relive everything. The headmaster tells him that he needs to know what happened after he touched the port key. Sirius wants it to wait until morning so Harry can rest, but Dumbledore insists that numbing the pain for a while will only make it worse when he finally feels it and asks him to show more of the bravery that he has shown tonight and tell them what happened. Fox lets out one quavering note, and it strengthens Harry, who takes a deep breath and explains everything that went down. Sirius nearly interrupts a couple of times, 
but Dumbledore keeps Harry talking, which is a relief to him. Harry finds it easier to keep going now that he's started, feeling as though something poisonous is being extracted from him. When he gets to the part where Wormtail pierced his arm with the dagger, Dumbledore stands and walks around the desk, asking to see it. As Dumbledore inspects his arm, Harry continues speaking, saying that Voldemort thought his blood would make him stronger than if he used someone else's, because he'd have the protection his mother left him too. Harry says that he was right, because he could touch him without hurting himself. For a fleeting moment, he notices a gleam of triumph in Dumbledore's eyes, but then he thinks he imagined it, because once back behind his desk, Dumbledore looks as old and tired as ever. He comments on how Voldemort overcame that particular barrier, then asks Harry to continue. Harry explains about him coming out of the cauldron as much as he could remember of his speech to the Death Eaters and being untied and prepared to duel. When he reaches the part about the golden beam of light connecting the wands, he feels a little choked up with the memories of everything and can't continue. Sirius breaks the silence, wondering why the wands connected, and Dumbledore mutters priori incantatum. Sirius asks if Dumbledore means the reverse spell effect, and the older wizard confirms this, explaining that Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand share cores, each containing a feather from the same phoenix, Fox. Harry is amazed to learn his wand's core came from Fox, but Sirius is more focused on what happens when a wand meets its brother. Dumbledore explains that they will not work properly against one another, and one wand will force the other to regurgitate the spells it had performed in reverse order. Harry nods as Dumbledore says that some form of Cedric must have reappeared, causing Sirius to think Diggory came back to life. Dumbledore reminds him that no spell can reawaken the dead. It would have merely been a shadow or echo of the living Cedric. Harry confirms this, saying that he spoke to him. Dumbledore assumes that other figures must have also appeared, and Harry manages to tell them about the old man and Bertha Jorkins. He starts to mention his parents as well, but hesitates, and Dumbledore does for him. Sirius's grip tightens on Harry's shoulder, and Dumbledore continues the conversation, asking what the Echoes did. Harry describes how Voldemort seemed to fear them, and how his father gave him instructions on what to do, and how Cedric made his final request. He is unable to continue speaking at this point, and notices that Sirius has his face in his hands. Fox has left Harry's knee and is crying onto his injured leg, healing the wounds from the spider. Dumbledore reiterates just how brave Harry was, saying he shouldered a grown wizard's burden and found himself equal to it. He directs him to go to the hospital wing with him and asks if Sirius would like to stay with him. Sirius transforms back into the great black dog and they all walk to the hospital wing where Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione are all waiting for him and harassing Madame Pomfrey. Mrs. Weasley hurries towards Harry but Dumbledore stops her, requesting they let him rest, saying they can stay with him if he likes but also that he does not want them questioning him until he's ready to answer. Mrs. Weasley nods and tells Ron, Hermione, and Bill that Harry needs quiet before Madame Pomfrey interrupts to ask about the dog. Dumbledore tells her that the dog will be remaining with Harry for a while and assures her that he is extremely well trained. He waits while Harry gets to bed and then tells him he must meet with Fudge, but then will be back to see him. Harry notices the real Mad-Eye in a bed on the other end of the room and asks the nurse if he's okay. Madame Pomfrey says that he will be fine and pulls screens around him so he can change into his pajamas. After he's ready for bed, Mrs. Weasley, Ron, Hermione, and Bill settle in chairs next to the bed and look cautiously at him. Harry tells him that he's fine, just tired, and Mrs. Weasley's eyes fill with tears. Madame Pomfrey hands him a goblet of purple potion for a dreamless sleep, and after a few mouthfuls, he becomes drowsy at once and falls asleep before he can even finish the potion. Harry awakes a while later, feeling that he couldn't have been asleep very long. He hears whispering all around him, worrying that the shouting is going to wake Harry if they don't shut up. Harry opens his eyes and sees the fuzzy outlines of Mrs. Weasley and Bill. She's whispering that the voices belong to Fudge and McGonagall and wonders what they are arguing about. 
Now Harry can hear the voices too, getting closer as they run towards the hospital wing. Fudge is loudly saying something is regrettable, and McGonagall is yelling that he never should have brought them into the castle. The hospital doors burst open and Fudge strides into the ward, closely followed by McGonagall and Snape. He demands to know where Dumbledore is, and as Mrs. Weasley is angrily reminding him that they're in a hospital wing, Dumbledore also enters the ward. He wants to know what happened and why Minerva isn't standing guard over Barty Crouch. A furious Professor McGonagall shrieks that thanks to the minister, there's no need to stand guard over him. In a low voice, Snape adds that when they told Fudge what happened tonight, he summoned a Dementor to accompany him to the castle. McGonagall continues saying that she told him Dumbledore would not approve, and Fudge interrupts, roaring that as Minister of Magic, it's his decision to bring protection when interviewing possibly dangerous suspects. McGonagall cuts him off, screaming that the moment the thing entered the room, it swooped down on Crouch. Harry feels a chill in his stomach, knowing exactly what the Dementor did. Fudge insists that he is no loss since he seems to be responsible for several deaths, and Dumbledore speaks up to point out that he now cannot give testimony or evidence as to why he killed those people. Fudge blusters that why he did it is no mystery and calls him a raving lunatic who seemed to think he was doing it on you-know-who's instructions. Dumbledore informs him that he was doing it on Lord Voldemort's instructions, so that he could be restored to full strength, and that the plan worked. Voldemort has been restored to his body. Fudge finds this to be preposterous, but Dumbledore interrupts, telling him that they all heard him confess under the influence of Veritas Serum. Fudge gets a slight smile on his face as he insists that Dumbledore can't really believe that he is back. He thinks that Crouch may have believed himself to be acting on his orders, but he thinks that he is just a lunatic and shouldn't be trusted. Dumbledore tells Fudge what happened after Harry touched the Triwizard Cup and how he witnessed Voldemort return, saying that if he accompanies him to his office, he will explain it all to him. Fudge continues to smile, asking if Dumbledore is prepared to take Harry's word on this. Dumbledore insists that he certainly believes Harry. The stories make sense and explain everything that has happened since Bertha Jorkins disappeared last summer. Fudge is still in complete denial that Voldemort has returned, focusing on the fact that he thinks Crouch was a lunatic. When he brings up Harry, he hesitates and Harry quietly speaks up, saying that Mr. Fudge has been reading Rita Skeeter. Fudge gets defensive about this, accusing Dumbledore of keeping things about the boy quiet, and Dumbledore interjects, stepping towards Fudge and radiating that indefinable sense of power again. He explains that Harry is as sane as they both are. He believes that Harry's scar hurts him when Voldemort is nearby or feeling particularly murderous. Fudge says that he's never heard of a cursed scar acting like that before, but Harry cuts him off, shouting that he saw Voldemort come back. He saw the Death Eaters and can give him their names. When he says Lucius Malfoy, Snape shifts, but then looks back at Fudge, who insists that Malfoy was cleared. Harry continues listing McNair, Avery, Knott, Crab, and Goyle, but Fudge insists that they all have been cleared and that he is merely repeating names of those who were acquitted of being Death Eaters 13 years ago. He turns back to Dumbledore and says that the boys' tails are getting taller and he's still swallowing them. He can talk to snakes, but he still thinks he's trustworthy? At this point, McGonagall joins in the argument again and calls the minister a fool, because the deaths were not the random work of a lunatic. Fudge insists that he sees no evidence to the contrary and accuses them of just trying to start a panic that will destabilize everything that they have worked for the past 13 years. Harry is shocked at how Fudge is behaving, and Dumbledore again insists that Voldemort has returned. He recommends that Fudge accepts that and takes the necessary measures to try and save the situation. The first is to remove the Dementors from control of Azkaban. Fudge again shouts that it is preposterous, that he'd be kicked out of office for suggesting it, since half of them only feel safe with the Dementors standing guard at Azkaban. Dumbledore points out that the rest of them sleep less soundly knowing that he put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks. Fudge can't think of a response to this, so Dumbledore continues giving instructions, saying the second step is to send envoys to the giants. 
Fudge finds his voice and declares this to be madness. But Dumbledore insists that they must extend the hand of friendship before it is too late, or Voldemort will persuade them to join him again. Fudge doesn't think he can be serious and worries that if he does any of that, it would be the end of his career. Dumbledore tells him that he is blinded by the love of the office that he holds, and that he places too much importance on the so-called purity of blood. He points out that his Dementor just destroyed the last remaining member of a pure-blood family, and to look at what he chose to make of his life. If Fudge takes the steps Dumbledore has suggested, he will go down in history as one of the bravest and greatest ministers of magic. If he fails to act, Voldemort will get a second chance to destroy the world they have tried to rebuild. Fudge whispers that it's insane and everyone falls silent for a moment. Dumbledore then says that if Cornelius is determined to shut his eyes to this, then they have reached a parting of the ways. Fudge must act as he sees fit, and Dumbledore will act as he sees fit. Fudge lectures Dumbledore about working against him, and Dumbledore insists that the only person he will be working against is Voldemort. If he is also against him, then they remain on the same side. Fudge again has nothing to say to this, and just speaks with a hint of a plea in his voice, saying that he just can't be back. Snape steps forward and holds out his forearm to show Fudge the dark mark that had burned black an hour ago. It isn't as clear as it was then, but he explains that it works to summon them, and it had been growing clearer all year. Karkaroff's too, and he fled when it burned because they knew that he had returned. Fudge steps back and shakes his head, telling Dumbledore that he doesn't know what he and his staff are playing at, but he has had enough. He unceremoniously drops off the 1,000 galleon winnings at Harry's bedside table, then leaves, slamming the door behind him. Dumbledore looks at Molly and says that there is work to be done, asking if he can count on her and Arthur. She says of course, and Dumbledore says he needs to send a message to Arthur about persuading as many people within the Ministry of the Truth as possible. Bill stands and says he will go to Dad right now, and Dumbledore tells him to be discreet, so Fudge doesn't think he is interfering at the Ministry. Bill leaves and Dumbledore asks Minerva to get Hagrid to his office as soon as possible, and Madame Maxime if she will agree to come too. He then addresses Madame Pomfrey as Poppy and asks her to find a house elf called Winky in Moody's office, and to help her as much as she can and then take her to the kitchens where Dobby will look after her for them. She agrees and leaves too. Dumbledore then asks Sirius to resume his usual form. The large dog turns back into a man, causing Mrs. Weasley to scream and Snape to snarl and ask what he is doing there. Dumbledore explains that they are both there at his invitation and need to put their differences aside, saying he will settle in the short term for lack of open hostility. The two men quickly shake hands while still glaring at one another, and Dumbledore moves on, asking Sirius to set off and alert the old crowd, including Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, and Mundungus Fletcher. Harry doesn't want his godfather to leave, but Sirius promises him that he will see him very soon and turns back into a dog to head out. Dumbledore then asks Severus if he is prepared to do what he must, and looking slightly paler than usual, Snape says that he is, and sweeps out after Sirius. Dumbledore then says he must go see the Diggories and tells Harry to take the rest of his potion. He leaves and Harry slumps back onto his pillow. They are all silent for a moment. Then Mrs. Weasley picks up the potion to give to Harry and nudges his bag of gold, suggesting he should think about what he's going to buy with his winnings. Harry says that he doesn't want it, because it should have been Cedric's. Mrs. Weasley tells him that it wasn't his fault, and Harry feels a burning in his throat when he says that he told him to take the cup with him. She sets the potion back down and gathers him into a mother's hug, causing Harry to screw up his face against the misery fighting to get out of him. They are interrupted by a slamming sound and look over to see Hermione standing near the window, holding something tightly in her hand. She apologizes in a whisper, and Mrs. Weasley again tells Harry to take his potion. He swallows it in one gulp and instantly falls back into a dreamless sleep. So, as we said, mm -hmm. none of this was in the movies. None of it. And I am infuriated. <laughs> This wasn't even recap. No. This chapter was 100% letting us know what the fuck happened. Filling in the gaps. Giving us the backstory. 
explaining things. Yeah, it was basically putting some concrete into the plot holes. Yeah, it fills us in on everything. Yes. Yes, it does. Not in the movie, though. Not even a little <laughs> bit. It starts off, which I guess did technically happen in the movie, when mm. Dumbledore leaves. Oh, ding. I get a ding. <laughs> It's my only ding the whole episode. <laughs> but he also uses his wand to tie him up. Yeah, which doesn't happen in the movie. So And asks Minerva to stand guard. Also doesn't happen in the movie. Right. Is there an anti-ding? <laughs> a dong. <laughs> a dong. <laughs> There's a lot of dongs in this episode. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a regular dong fest. Now you're just being a ding dong. <laughs> Anywho, Dumbledore takes Harry upstairs, and Minerva is the one who stays there and points her wand mm -hmm. at Barty Crouch Jr. She does this very confidently, but she has a nauseous look on her face. Like, she looks like she's going to be sick. Can you blame her? No. A lot has just happened. I cannot. But that's as close as we get to something that happened in the movie. Hafting? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Dumbledore also asks Severus to go get Madame Pomfrey to take care of Alistair Moody mm -hmm. and wants him to find Cornelius Fudge so he can question Crouch too. Yeah. Assuming that that's something the Minister of Magic would want to do. You would think. You would think. We're about to learn that he doesn't. Nope. And then he asks Harry to accompany him up to his office so that they can chat. And he lets him know that Sirius is waiting there for him as well. Unless, of course, you're watching the movie. In which case, Sirius was not there at all. Yeah. Mm -mm. At this point, Harry's feeling pretty numb. Like you do. It's still that shock that he went through, I'm sure. Yeah. But he's kind of relieved about that because things keep flashing through his mind in pictures. Like he keeps... Seeing Voldemort rise out of the cauldron. He mm -hmm. keeps seeing Wormtail in his fucking bloody stump. He keeps seeing poor Mad-Eye Moody, the real one, in his fucking trunk. Yeah. He keeps seeing Cedric, the echo of Cedric, asking him to bring his body back to his parents. But it's more disjointed and he's not focused on it. The numbness is really helping with that. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's a little bit of backstory. So it's kind of... Yeah, I get not detailing things like that yeah but we're talking about a long chapter of nothing yeah included harry wonders where cedric's parents are and dumbledore explains that they're with professor sprout since she is the head of cedric's house she knew him best mm -hmm. so that makes sense and then they get to the stone gargoyle and dumbledore gives the password which we don't get to learn what it was this time it's just dumbledore gives the password yeah Gargoyle jumps aside and they go up the moving spiral staircase. And the second Dumbledore opens that oak door, Sirius is in man form like, what happened? And actually, I would have loved to see Gary Oldman play this part because Sirius is just like, I knew something like this was going to happen. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for a movie that got super slapsticky, that would have been fun. Right. Not to mention more Gary Oldman, more crazy Gary Oldman. Crazy Gary Oldman. But no, we don't even get depressed Gary Oldman. We just get no Gary Oldman, which is lack of Gary Oldman. Lack of Gary Oldman. See, that doesn't sound good. It doesn't. It sounds horrible. I actually feel a little depressed myself. Ugh, rude. Dumbledore then fills him in on what actually happened. Mm -hmm. What? Well, what he learned from Crouch anyway. Because at this point, he hasn't gotten Harry's side of the story. And Harry just kind of sits down opposite Dumbledore's desk and just like half listens. And Fox flutters down and lands on his leg and just like so gives guys. him a little bit of comfort. Bird cuddles. And he just goes, low, Fox. And then his hoarse voice. And I love the apostrophe L-O instead mm -hmm. of saying hello. Low, Fox. Hello, and Fox. the moment that he speaks, Dumbledore stops talking and is just like, oh, he's ready. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if ready is the right word to use, but... Yeah. Close enough. Mm -hmm. He sits down at his own desk chair opposite Harry. And Harry's just like, I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> I can't see you. You can't see me. Because mm -hmm. he knows what's about to happen. And he really doesn't want to relive everything. Understandably so. He's just been through an incredibly traumatic experience. But Dumbledore's just like, dude, I need to know what happened after yeah. you touched the portkey. I got to know everything. It's important to get all those details when they're fresh. Yeah. 
as much as that sucks, it's very important to get them when they're fresh. And also, that can also help with the healing process, too. It can. And Dumbledore even specifically says that. Because Sirius says, can't this wait till morning? Let Harry have a good sleep. And Dumbledore is just like, I mean, I could numb the pain now. Mm-hmm. It's just going to hurt more later. Yeah. When he does actually feel it. And he tells him that he has shown more bravery than could ever have been expected of him. Mm-hmm. But he's just like, but I got to ask you to show more. Yeah. Like, please... Tell us what happened. I got to ask more of you, kid. Sorry. I know you've been through some shit, but yeah, it's about to get shittier because you need to tell us everything. And Fox lets out this one quavering note that Harry feels slide down his throat like a hot liquid. Aww. And it settles in his stomach and kind of calms him. And he takes a deep breath and he's just like, okay, here's what happened. Mm-hmm. And now you'd think that this is about to be a recap. But it was brilliantly written, and it doesn't recap. It barely sums up. It just says he tells them about this. He tells them about this. He tells them about this. And there's a couple of times when Sirius nearly interrupts, and Dumbledore's just like, hand up in the air. Stop. Mm -hmm. And Harry's super relieved because now that he's started talking, it's just word vomiting out of his mouth. And he just... Screaming, yeah. He wants to keep going. It's easier to keep going, get it all done. It even feels like something poisonous is being extracted. Mm -hmm. It is healing. Cleansing, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But then he gets to the part where Wormtail stabbed him with the dagger to take his blood. And Dumbledore actually stands up and comes to see it. So this is as close as we get to the movie as you can without actually being in the movie because... I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Exactly. That is what they did. Yeah. That was their equivalent to Dumbledore inspecting Harry's wound. Yes. I mean, it was a wonderfully delivered line, but there was no damn reason for it. Nope. But Harry continues his cleansing story and tells Dumbledore that Voldemort thought that using Harry's blood was going to make him stronger than using anybody else's because he'd get some of that protection that his mother left within his Mm -hmm. veins. And then he was just like, and he was right because after he came back, he could touch me. He touched my head. Yeah. It didn't hurt him. In this moment, I don't entirely know how they could have shown it in the movie, but they could have shown it in the movie. Oh, they could have. They totally could have. And this is so unbelievably significant. Mm -hmm. And I remember the very first time that I ever read this, I was like, that means something. Yeah. There is no way. I obsessed over it. I don't think anyone read that and didn't think it meant something. Because this is the book that was coming out when I first met Harry Potter. Yeah. I devoured the first three and impatiently had to wait a few days to get to read this one. <laughs> yeah. Because of your slow reading brother. Right? He doesn't even read that slowly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when I actually got to read it and I just demolished it, mm-hmm. I then obsessed over it. Yeah. Because there was no more for me to read. I literally went back and reread all of them. But mm-hmm. I just analyzed every single aspect of it that I could. And I was like, this line means something. Yeah. Because for a fleeting moment, Harry notices a gleam of triumph that Voldemort could touch Harry. Of all the things to see in someone's eyes, that's not really the thing you want to see when someone's talking about how I can cause you pain by touching you. Yes. And then Harry thinks he imagined it because once Dumbledore sits back down behind his desk, he just looks as old and tired as ever. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I just remember being like, why? Why was that in there? That means something. Yeah. And we're going to talk about what it means later on. But oh, this needed to be in the movie in some fashion. Yes. It explains so much about why Dumbledore acted the way that he acted. Mm -hmm. Why he withheld information, why he gave him what he did. It explains so much. Yeah. And we never got that. We never, ever, ever did. Not even... A modicum of it. Like, we got nothing. Nothing. But Dumbledore then comments on how Voldemort overcame that particular barrier. Mm-hmm. 
We've got others to put in the way. Oh, there's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> but he asks Harry to continue. And that's just very much Dumbledore style in all of the books. Yeah. Very calm. He gathers information. Yeah. And he sees things in it that other people don't see. And he makes sense of it. And that's this entire chapter. This entire chapter in the back half of the last chapter was Dumbledore gathering and confirming. Mm -hmm. And we got none of that. And it, like I said last week, it just makes Dumbledore look like this angry buffoon. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and he I said it. <laughs> this omniscient, omnipotent even. Like he is all powerful. He is all knowing. He isn't always correct. He's a good guesser, basically. His mm -hmm. guesses are pretty good, you know? Yeah. The dude is smart and the dude is powerful and he did not get any of that. No. In the movies. He was done dirty. I mean. Not that he was flawless, but even he'll no. tell you that. I mean, he fully admits what he is. He yeah. fully admit Like, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to hide how good he is. But he also doesn't try to hide that a lot of it seems to be coming along the right information at the right time. Yeah. When he even says that being as clever as he is his mistakes tend to be correspondingly huger like, yeah he knows when he fucks up he fucks up he fucks hey. up and that's why it's so important to him to handle things in a very specific way yeah he's trying to not fuck up exactly but he's human also off topic he just very calmly gathers this information and he did it with barty crouch jr he's doing it with harry just continue yeah tell me about this and harry explains to him about how voldemort came up out of the cauldron and tries to remember as much as he could remember about the speech of the death eaters which understandably that he can't remember at all that was a fucking long monologue it was yeah <laughs> oh yeah he got he got voldy monologuing hard yeah plus there was a whole thing about taco tuesday oh wait that didn't happen no that was the Shit. movie <laughs> never mind take it back and then harry got to the part of the story where he was untied, given his wand back, and prepared to duel. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this is not being recapped. No. I'm not summing up what he talked about in the book. It was just a sum up in the book. Yeah. I don't know exactly how they could have done it in the movie without doing a teensy bit of a recap. But they could have done this. Oh, they, they could so have could've. given us the new information that we're coming into. Yeah. Because when he reaches the part about the wands connecting with that golden light beam, mm -hmm. he gets really choked up because obviously he's getting to the part where he literally sees dead people. Yeah. It's a heavy moment for yeah. him. Yeah. It definitely is. And Sirius breaks the silence wanting to know why the wands connected and Dumbledore first just mutters Priori and Cantatum. This was kind of included in the movie. A little hafting again. But we're going to talk about it next week. And it's basically just nothing more than just saying the two words. Like, there's no explanation for it. It's never even said what it is. He literally just says two words and that's it. That's it. That's our explanation. Yeah. Whereas the book previously taught us what priori and cantatum is. So this isn't even the first time we hear that phrase. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, Sirius is like, you mean the reverse spell effect? And Dumbledore's like, yeah, it happened because Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand share a core. They both have a phoenix feather coming from the same phoenix. This phoenix, actually. And he, like, points at Fox. <laughs> and Harry's just sitting there like, my wand core comes from Fox? <laughs> and that was actually probably an excellent tidbit of information for him to gain right there. Because I imagine it was very distracting from all of the awful for a brief well, moment. Because yeah. he feels bonded with Fox. Fox has saved his life before. Like, and he's already cuddling with him, too. Right? So it's it's got to just be a moment where he was like, oh, Fox is with me everywhere I go. Yeah. You know, that he didn't realize that before. And it would just make him feel very bonded and protected. It also explains why he feels like he has such a connection to the Phoenix song in mm -hmm. general. Because it has helped him multiple times Yeah, in this book now. Yes. Even just the one little note made him feel better. Yeah. And the song encouraging him to hold on. I wonder if because it was the Phoenix Feather Core, if that's why he heard the Phoenix song when the ones connected. 
That would make sense. I mean, that would. I never considered that before until now. Huh. <laughs> But Harry's all like, oh, my one came from Fox. And Sirius is just more focused on like, okay, well, what happens? Like, yeah, how does this work? So Dumbledore explains that two wands that share a core won't work properly against one another. But if somebody tries to make them duel, one wand will force the other to regurgitate all of the spells that it's done in reverse order. Spellgurgitate. Spellgurgitate. <laughs> episode title there we go <laughs> and harry's just like yep that's what happened yeah <laughs> so dumbledore's like and you saw some form of cedric mm -hmm. come out of the wand and sirius is like dickory came back to life <laughs> dumbledore's just like well no spell can reawaken the dead yeah not quite guy however it can create like a shadow or an echo of the living cedric mm-hmm that will retain his likeness and memories. And Harry's just like, that's what happened. I actually spoke to him. Yeah. So Dumbledore asks if other figures came out as well. And Harry manages to tell them about the old man who we know is Frank Bryce. Although I don't know that Harry would have ever known him by name. No. We I just don't... do because of the book. Exactly. And then, of course, Bertha Jorkins, who he does know by name because he's had several conversations yes. about her at this point. Not in the movie, though. <laughs> Not in the movie, though. But he starts to mention his parents as well and again gets really choked up and stops. So Dumbledore says, and your parents, mm -hmm. which makes Sirius grip tighten on his shoulder. He's like squeezing his shoulder almost painfully <laughs> at this point. Fingernails, but fingernail marks But that would have there. to be traumatizing for Sirius to hear as well. Oh, yeah. I don't want to cry. I know. <laughs> and yes. This is slightly recappy information. Slightly, yes. But it's in the process of explaining why it happened, which we don't know I was in saying, the movie. It brings on new information, yes. which is the important part. Right. So Dumbledore just keeps the conversation flowing, staying very calm, wants to know what the Echoes did. Mm -hmm. And Harry describes how Voldemort was actually kind of afraid of them. Yeah. Which... I mean, Dumbledore has even said himself, I think that was in a later book, that Voldemort fears the dead. He doesn't yeah. have anybody he loves. There's nobody he wants to remember. Mm -hmm. So having these people come out would actually be kind of intimidating to him, I would think. Right. Not to mention the fact that he fears death above everything. Right. In general. Yeah. So to have death come at you. <laughs> right. Scare the shit out of me. But yeah. And in that moment, mm -hmm. Harry technically overpowered Voldemort. Yeah. He kicked some ass, yeah. really. I mean, for being a 14-year-old. And it was in a believable sense because it wasn't like he cast a super powerful charm. He was just more determined in the long run. And like we said a few weeks ago, how Voldemort was completely out of his element and that probably intimidated the shit out of him, whereas Harry's always out of his element. So right? he wasn't that intimidated. <laughs> he was just like, I don't know what's going on. This is the huge. Yeah. Par for the course. Right. Nothing new here. <laughs> I just go with it usually, and that seems to work out. So I'm just going to do that this time, too. Why not? It worked <laughs> out. Yeah. Mostly. But Harry continues telling Dumbledore about how his father gave him instructions on what to do and how Cedric made his final request. And he's done. He can't say anything more. He is way too choked up. And even Sirius has his hands buried in his face. Like, this is so emotional. Mm-hmm. We really missed out. We got bilked. Hard. So hard. Can you imagine? I know how hard I cried at, like, the last movie. Can you imagine how hard you'd be crying at this? I cried so hard with Cedric's father's reaction. Yes. If we had seen Harry and Sirius have this moment over James and Lily. Mm hmm Oh, bawling like a baby. Yep. No doubt about it. There's not even... I wouldn't even be able to say, like, oh, I got allergies. No. Right. no I'm, it's, <laughs> just, I can't I'm not do crying. it. I'm not crying. You're crying. We're all crying. Everyone's <laughs> crying because it's really fucking sad. Basically. Yeah. Summed up. is That's exactly how it would have gone. <laughs> and then at this point, Fox actually leaves Harry's knee and starts crying over the wound on his leg from the spider and heals it for him. About time. Jeez. <laughs> And Dumbledore then reiterates just how brave Harry was when he specifically says, 
you shouldered a grown wizard's burden and found yourself equal to it. Mm -hmm. Which he did. Like, yeah, this was huge for Harry. Yeah. This was a night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's faced Voldemort twice now. But Technically it's three been... times. Well, yeah. Technically four times. Well. As a baby on the back of Quirrell's head as Tom Riddle and now in the graveyard. But he's faced Voldemort all these other times. But he's always been not at a peak. Like yeah. there's, he's always been meh before this. When he was on the back of Coral's head, he was a shadow of his former self. When he was in Tom Riddle's diary, he was just a piece of a soul, a soul, and that was it. This time, it was the full Monty. It was the full. It wasn't just the bowl. It yeah. was the bowl. The more exactly. Did you just call Voldemort a, a, a bowl? A I bowl. did. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. All right. Just checking. But anyway, like I said, this chapter was not about the recap. We needed a little bit of recap to get that new information. Mm -hmm. We're done with the recap. We now get to move on and gain even more new information. Yep. Because Harry's finished summing up the story for Dumbledore to let him know what happened. Mm-hmm. And Dumbledore takes him down to the hospital wing. He lets Sirius stay with him in dog form. So the three of them go down to the hospital wing. And they find Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione trying to find him, waiting for him there. They've basically been harassing Madame Pomfrey. Like, where's Harry? Why isn't he here? What happened? What's going on? And I can just imagine Madame Pomfrey like frazzled as all shit. Like, right. I don't know anything. Get these redheads away from me. <laughs> <laughs> get these redheads in the know-it-all away from me <laughs> but then the second they walk into the hospital wing and see harry like mrs weasley just runs for him and dumbledore's just like hold on there <laughs> he needs rest yeah you can stay with him if he wants but just leave him be yeah let him go but he says that he needs peace and quiet and molly just turns to her kids and hermione and just like shushes them like they were making noise <laughs> Did you hear he needs quiet? <laughs> like, yeah, okay. It would have been kind of funny if she turned and yelled and was like, he needs pace and quiet. Would you guys shut up? Oh. <laughs> but then at this point, Madame Pomfrey's just like, what is going on? Looking at Sirius in dog form. And Dumbledore's just like, the dog's going to be staying with Harry for a while. I assure you, he's very well trained. <laughs> That's his support animal. Right. I feel like... <laughs> If Harry were in the right state of mind upon hearing Dumbledore say that Sirius is very well trained, I feel like there had to be at least a little part of his brain that went, is he? Yeah. <laughs> or just be like, yeah, watch, sit. <laughs> <laughs> sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Good dog. <laughs> sit, Snuffle, sit. <laughs> but Dumbledore just hangs out long enough for Harry to get to a bed and then explains he has to go talk to the minister and then he'll come back to see him. Mm-hmm. So as Madame Pomfrey is helping him get ready for bed, Harry notices that the real Mad-Eye Moody is in another bed on the other side of the hospital wing. And it's just like, is he okay? Which mm -hmm. I just think is so sweet. Mm -hmm. With everything that's going on, Harry actually cares enough to ask how a man that he technically never even met was. Yeah. It definitely shows Harry's selflessness. Yeah. And how even after everything, all he wants to do is like, no, make sure everyone is yeah. okay. And it's very sweet and adorable. And it is. Movie Harry didn't get that chance. Not really, no. No. But Madame Pomfrey says that he's going to be fine and then pulls screens around the bed so Harry can change into his pajamas with a little bit of privacy. And then as he gets into bed, Mrs. Weasley, Ron, Hermione, and Bill settle in chairs next to him. And they're all just like staring at him. Like nobody knows what to say. Nobody knows what to do. They're all being really <laughs> quiet. And Harry's just like, I'm fine. Just tired. I'm sleepy. And then Mrs. Weasley's eyes fill with tears. And like, I mean, she's in like near full mama bear mode at this mm -hmm. point. Like calmer because he's there. He's okay. Yeah. But she's, she is emotional. And all she wants to do is just take care of her cub. Get him in a little cuddle puddle and just take care of him until mm -hmm. he has no worries in the world. Madame Pomfrey gives Harry a goblet of purple potion for a dreamless sleep. Which was our trivia question. Yep. And Harry isn't even able to finish it. He gets a few mouthfuls and immediately falls asleep. 
That's some good shit right there. Apparently, I could use something like that. That's the indica. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Anyway, probably partially because he didn't actually finish the potion and partially because shit was going down. Harry wakes up a little bit later mm-hmm. and he's just like, there's no way I was asleep for that long. And he can hear whispering all around him. Mostly Mrs. Weasley and Bill, like, frantically discussing what's going on. They're like, that sounds like Fudge and McGonagall, but what are they arguing about? They're going to wake everybody up if they keep yelling like that. Don't they know Harry needs quiet? Right. (laughs) And at this point, it's getting so loud and Harry's awake enough that he can hear the yelling too. And it's getting even closer because they're just running towards the hospital wing. Mm -hmm. And Fudge is saying something about something being regrettable and McGonagall is just yelling that he never should have brought it into the castle and the hospital doors just burst open and Fudge just like bam I'm an asshole like (laughs) closely followed by McGonagall and Snape and they're all looking for Dumbledore Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Weasley's just like you are in a hospital wing (laughs) and I, I feel like she's doing that thing again where she's trying to be quiet but she's not yeah you need to knock this off. You're going to wake Harry up. Harry needs his sleep. If you wake that boy up, so help me God. Right? hmm But before she gets too far into a rant that was probably going to lead to her voice rising herself, yes. Dumbledore also enters the ward, and he wants to know what happens. And again, Dumbledore does not yell. Mm-hmm. He very calmly says, Minerva, I'm surprised at you. I asked you to stand guard over Barty Crouch. Hmm. No. It's Minerva who's not calm because she's just like, I don't have to do that anymore. The minister has seen to that. And Snape actually maintains a little bit of calmness as well. And he steps in to just be like, yeah, the moment we told Fudge about what went down, he felt the need to summon a Dementor to the castle for his own personal protection. And then he took the Dementor into Moody's office. And Minerva streaks again, saying that she tried to tell him that Dumbledore would not approve of this. And Fudge is just like, I'm the fucking Minister of Magic. I do what I want. (laughs) And McGonagall cuts him off again to tell Dumbledore that the moment he brought the Dementor into the room, it swooped down on Barty Crouch Jr. Yeah. And we all know what happened then. And Harry knows what happened then. Everybody knows what happened then. It's pretty obvious. And Fudge is there just like, he's no loss. The dude murdered a bunch of people. And Dumbledore's just like, yeah, but now he can't give testimony or evidence as to why he did that shit. Mm -hmm. And Fudge is just being his normal blustery self like, it's no mystery why he did it. The dude's a raving lunatic. He thought he was doing it on you know whose instructions. And Dumbledore's just like, uh... Because he was doing it on Voldemort's instructions. (laughs) Fudge is such a... He's such a... A corny fudge. You know, I can't think of a nicer term, so sure. (laughs) (laughs) I just mean he's so just... And then he's... And then he's... And then just fuck that guy, you know? Yeah. (laughs) I don't think you could say it better than that. I think I've summed it up quite well. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, Dumbledore is just like, all of this, all of the shit that he did was about restoring Voldemort to power and it worked. Mm -hmm. He's got his body back. And Fudge is just, you know, still blustery. Preposterous. Dumbledore is just like, we all heard him confess under the influence of Veritaserum. Yeah, you know what's preposterous is the fact that you somehow became Minister of Magic, you dumbass. That's preposterous. <laughs> but beside the point at this point. Yes. When Dumbledore says that they heard him confess under the influence of Veritaserum, Fudge gives this like slight smile, like a really almost smug smile. And he's just like, you can't really believe he's back. Motherfucker, I will cut you. He's like, Crouch may have believed he was acting on you know whose orders, but he's just a lunatic. We can't trust his word. That's so frustrating. It's so excessively frustrating when you deal with a person who's like that. But you want to know how Dumbledore reacted? Hmm. It wasn't to yell at Fudge. Well, no, because Dumbledore is level-headed. Well, book Dumbledore is level-headed. Yeah. And he very calmly tells Fudge that he heard Crouch's confession. He heard Harry's side of the story of what happened after he touched the quad wizard cup. 
and how he witnessed Voldemort return. And he's like, and if you accompany to my office so we aren't disturbing the fine people here in this hospital wing, I will explain it all to you and you'll see that you're the one that's being preposterous. Mm Mm-hmm. Fudge, however, just continues to smile, that smug little fuck you smile, asking if Dumbledore is prepared to take Harry's word on this. Uh, fuck yeah, I am. Dumbledore's just like, well, certainly I believe Harry. Everything makes sense, and it explains everything that Mm -hmm. happened since Bertha Jorgen's disappearance last summer, which is something that you haven't been able to solve, might I remind you. Yeah. But Fudge is still in complete denial. He's so infuriating. I would have loved to hate movie fudge this much. Right? We were not given that opportunity. No, like he was an idiot. I mean, he was not in this. And Robert Hardy played fudge so well, he could have nailed this scene. He could have laid this out with no problem. Not only did we get bilked, he got bilked. Mm Mm-hmm. Agreed. Because he's in complete denial over the idea that Voldemort could possibly be back. Still just insisting that Crouch was a lunatic. And then also relying on the fact that Harry's been having funny turns all over the place. And Harry's just like, you've been reading Rita Skeeter. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty funny, too, because nobody realized Harry was awake at this point. So when he speaks up, like everybody jumps. (laughs) And Fudge is just like, so what if I have? Harry... I'd almost forgotten you were here. Mm. (laughs) But yeah, like everybody jumps and Fudge is just like, so what if I have? Accusing Dumbledore of keeping things about him quiet, like the funny turns and being able to speak parcel tongue and... None of which has any bearing on any of this. Right. And Dumbledore's just like, do you mean that the headaches that Harry gets, like when his scar hurts? Because I'm pretty sure that just happens whenever Voldemort is close by or feeling particularly murderous. Mm -hmm. And Pfizer's just like, I've never heard of a cursed scar acting like an alarm bell before. Well, motherfucker, no one's ever had this cursed scar before. So how about you take it and shove it up your ass? How about that? Exactly. Ugh. Ugh. So frustrated. <laughs> and again, Dumbledore is just radiating that indefinable power that Harry noticed when he first approached not Moody in mm-hmm. the office. And he's just like, Harry is as sane as both of us. Well, one of us. Well, Cause there is that. Because fuck Fudge's Fudge. Fudge's ass ain't sane. And this is when Fudge is actually making the curse scar, acting like an alarm bell. And Harry just cuts him off and starts shouting because Harry doesn't have the same chill that Dumbledore has. Yeah. He took his cues from Michael Gammon's book. Obviously. But also, he's also coming out of this nice little dreamless sleep, too, and being bombarded with this stupid shit coming out of Fudge's mouth. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying I blame Harry for shouting at him. Like, I'm surprised Harry didn't shout sooner. He's just like, (laughs) I saw Voldemort come back. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know the names of the Death Eaters? I can give you their names. Lucius Malfoy. Mm -hmm. And Snape, like kind of jerks a little bit at this point but then he gets himself back together and yeah just focuses back on fudge who's just like malfoy was cleared very old family donations to excellent causes yeah like your own fucking wallet probably right jesus the malfoy wing of the department of fuck all can you know give you a big old thank you blowjob or whatever i I don't know where i'm going with this i would have gone with the malfoy wing of fudge's own fucking house yeah there we go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but Harry also lists off McNair, Avery, Knott, Crab, Goyle, and Fudge is like, they've all been cleared. You're merely repeating names of those who were acquitted of being Death Eaters 13 years ago. You could have gotten them off of any of the files where people were documenting the trials. Yeah, except I didn't. I got them from Voldemort's fucking mouth when he said, hey, sup, Crab. Hey, what's sup, up, Goyle? <laughs> Jesus. I saw them with my own goddamn eyes. I was in the quad wizard tournament this year. When do you think I had time to do fucking research for this particular night? Right? You think I'm just... Do I look like the type that does research? Maybe Hermione did it for me and fed me this information, but you don't hear her saying anything because that's not how it happened. I don't even want to say how'd that go again because I don't want you to do it again. I don't think I could do that again. I don't want you to do that again ever, please. But Fudge is just like, this boy's tails are getting taller and taller and you're still swallowing them. He can talk to snakes and you still think he's trustworthy? 
Oh, whatever, you Napoleonic little shit. <laughs> Come on. Yes. At this point, Minerva joins in some more shouting. Yay! Bring it, Minnie. Oh, she does. She calls <laughs> the minister a fool. Ooh. Points out that the deaths were not the random work of a lunatic. Mm-hmm. Although Fudge is a fool and says, I see no evidence to the contrary. And then he accuses them of trying to start a panic that will destabilize everything they've built up the past 13 years. Really, though, guy? Like, really? Uh, really. That's what he said. Uh. And then Harry's just sitting there like, what the fuck? I always thought he was like this kindly old man. He's acting like a total asshole right now. And Dumbledore's just like, still calm. Look, Voldemort's back. Mm hmm. You can accept that and take the necessary measures to fix this shit. Before it gets worse. Because it's going to fucking get worse, y'all. Yeah, he's like, if you'll do this, you'll be remembered as one of the greatest ministers of magic ever. If you don't, well, shit's going to hit the fan. You're going to be a fucking clown, boy. Stay tuned to find out which one he chooses. Spoiler alert, he's got a big red nose and a <laughs> rainbow wig. And giant feet. <laughs> but Dumbledore says the first thing that he needs to do is remove the Dementors from Azkaban. Mm -hmm. And Fudge again says, preposterous, because that's just his word. You keep using that word. <laughs> I do not think it means what you think it means. He says he'll be kicked out of office for suggesting it. Well, then we'll all be better off, won't we? Right. He says half of them only feel safe with the Dementors standing guard there. And Dumbledore's just like, well... The other half of us sleep less soundly knowing that you put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks. What you gotta say to that, Corny? He actually can't think of anything to say to this. Well, yeah, because there's nothing to say to it. He's got nothing. Mm -hmm. He just like, the duh. Uh, duh, duh. So Dumbledore continues telling him, you also need to send Envoy to the Giants. And again... Preposterous. I don't think he actually says it this time, but I'm positive he thought it. Well, he must have. He does declare it to be madness. But Dumbledore's just like, no, you need to extend them the hand of friendship or Voldemort's going to persuade them to join him again. And I don't think it's going to take that much for them to be persuaded. No. Again, Fudge is like, you can't be serious. If I do any of this, it'll be the end of my career. Yeah, well, if you don't do it, it could be the end of your life, son. Which would also end your career. Well, that's true. It could get me kicked out of office. <laughs> oh, it could get me killed. Or worse, kicked, kicked out, out of office. office. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and Dumbledore has a mic drop moment. Still calm, mind you. Mm -hmm. Saying, you are blinded by the love of the office that you hold. And you place too much importance on the so-called purity of blood. That's some deep words, man. Right? He says, your Dementor just destroyed the last remaining member of a pure blood family as old as any. And look at what he chose to make of his life. Mm -hmm. Blood doesn't matter. Who you choose to be is what matters. Yeah. And you are choosing to be a fuck nut. <laughs> Dumbledore didn't say that part. I interjected. It was implied. Yeah. Definitely. He says, if you take these steps that I'm suggesting, you'll go down in history as one of the bravest and greatest ministers of magic. If you don't... You're just going to give Voldemort a second chance to destroy the world that we've tried to rebuild. And then you're going to go down in history as a fucknut. Oh, wait. You already are. Spoilers. <laughs> Fudge barely has anything to say at this point. He mm -hmm. manages to whisper that it's insane. And everybody just kind of falls silent for a moment. So Dumbledore says, if you're determined to shut your eyes to this, we've reached a parting of the ways. He so speaks in cross-stitch, man. Chapter title. <laughs> He says, you must act as you see fit, and I will act as I see fit. Mm -hmm. And Fudge is just like, if you're going to work against me, blah, 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 blah. Like, just all blustery. He's just like, I've given you a lot of respect. I've let you hire people that other people wouldn't have let you hire. Not many people would let you hire werewolves. Let's get one thing fucking straight, sir. You didn't let me do anything. Right? <laughs> You avoided getting a bitch slap by not saying a damn thing while I did whatever the hell I wanted. 
And that's going to keep happening. Sorry. Yeah, he didn't let Dumbledore do anything. Mm -mm. Dumbledore totally does what he wants and apologizes later if he has to. Yeah. But he cuts Fudge off in his little like... And he's just like, the only person I am going to be working against is Voldemort. If you're against Voldemort, then we remain Cornelius on the same side. Mm Mm-hmm. So lovely. It's such a fuck you. Again, all still calm. Mm -hmm. Never once has he raised his voice at this man. Well, he doesn't need to. Tell that to Michael Gambon and Newell. Newell. Again, Fudge is just completely speechless. And all he can manage to say is he just can't be back. I get being desperate for it to not be true. But maybe don't let your desperation make you act like a fucknut. Honest to God, man. Corny fucknut. It's his middle name. Corny fucknut fudge. (laughs) But anyway, Snape comes forward at this point and pulls up his sleeve to show him the dark mark on his arm. Mm -hmm. He's like, it's not as dark as it was an hour ago when it first burned at his return. But But it's there, guys. It's still here. It's been growing clearer all year. Karkaroff's too. That's why he bolted the moment we felt it burn. Mm -hmm. Because he betrayed too many Death Eaters to think he was going to get a warm welcome back. Yeah, and we did not get a damn bit of explanation for Karkaroff in the movie. No, they literally had him showing the mark to Snape at one point, being really secretive about it. Yeah. They had that weird moment where he was like sneaking into the Great Hall when they had put the goblet in there and never explained that. No. I'm all for building up red herrings, even making changes from the books to do so but at least fucking sum it up at the end like give us a resolution honestly at least like show him sneaking off or doing whatever he went to go do yeah a brief little scene of him seeing the dark mark and running yeah something something Something. but no heaven forbid fudge is like what the fuck i don't know what you and your staff are playing at but i've had enough and he just like walks past Harry's bed and basically just drops a bag of a thousand galleons on his bedside table. And he's just like, there should have been a ceremony, but considering the circumstances, here's your winnings, kid. And then just leaves and slams the door behind him. For the record, how big must that bag have been? I would have loved to hear the sound of it. Ching! Yep. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Bag drop. But at this point, Dumbledore looks at Molly and is like, there's work that we got to do now. Mm -hmm. No time to rest. Can I count on you and Arthur? And she's like, yeah, duh. Of course you can. Obviously. That was never a question. Right. And Dumbledore's like, okay, I need to get a message to Arthur as soon as possible so that he can persuade as many people within the ministry of the truth before Fudge starts putting out his side of the story. Mm -hmm. And Bill, being of age this time around, is just like, I'll go right now. I'll go see dad right now. I'm on it, guy. And Dumbledore's just like, excellent. Tell him to be discreet. I can't have Fudge thinking I'm interfering at the ministry. (laughs) Bill's just like, leave it to me. He gives Harry a clap on the shoulder and strides out of the room himself. We didn't get any Bill. No, no Bill. At this point, I would have loved to have met him sooner. One might say that we got bilked. (laughs) Glad you came with me on that. Oh, always. (laughs) You're going to make a pun of joining you. (laughs) Dumbledore then asks Minerva if she can go get Hagrid and Madame Maxime if she's willing to come as well Mm -hmm. and take them to his office so he can have a chat with them too. And he asks Madame Pomfrey, calling her Poppy, which I love knowing that's her name. Mm -hmm. It's such a cute name. I know. But he asks her to find the house elf called Winky in Moody's office and help her out as much as she can. She's going to be very distressed. I was going to say, she's probably not going to be in the best of moods. So do what you can for her and then take her down to the kitchens. I'm sure that Dobby will look after her for us. Mm -hmm. And Madame Pomfrey is a little confused, but it's just like, okay, and leaves too. So what Dumbledore is really doing here is clearing out some of the extras. Not that McGonagall was one that had to be cleared out, but he did need to talk to Hagrid. I mean, there were things that needed to be done. Yeah. In the case of McGonagall, she was the best one to execute that. Yeah. But also, side note, it also helped to clear the room. Yes. So clear <laughs> out the room a little bit because Dumbledore then says, Sirius, please take your usual form. And I love the fact that he literally is just like, Sirius, take your usual form. Mm-hmm. And the large black dog turns into Sirius Black and Mrs. Weasley's like, Sirius Black! <laughs> 
oh shit like what did you think was gonna happen there molly and ron's just like it's fine mom shut up (laughs) and why didn't we get to see this because they don't love us and want us to be happy i guess and then snape's just like what is he doing here oh snape i love it and dumbledore's just like uh i invited him just like i invited you so you guys need to stop acting like children and put your shit aside we're gonna be adults Mm -hmm. we're gonna get along we got shit to do guys right i'm going to settle for lack of open hostility right now so you need to shake hands and make nice Mm -hmm. and they're like do the super fastest handshake ever like glaring at each other the whole time i just imagine them being like ew (laughs) (laughs) You totally know they both like wipe their hands on oh, their pants I'm sure, afterwards. Oh, I'm sure, but they would have loved to see that happen. <laughs> but anyway, Dumbledore then moves on and asks Sirius to go alert the old crowd, referring to Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, and Mundungus Fletcher. Mm-hmm, getting the gang back together. Get the old gang back together. And Harry doesn't want Sirius to leave. He doesn't. And Harry does not want his dog father to leave. But Sirius is just like, "You will see me very soon. I promise." And then he turns back into the dog and leaves. Now, this is the one that I am the most disappointed. We did not get to actually watch happen in the films. Mm -hmm. Because I think the films otherwise did a very good job showing who Snape truly was. Yeah. Almost to the point where they took away some of the shit that was still about him. They redeemed him a little too much. A little too much. Yeah, I agree. They made him genuinely more good than great. Mm hmm. And he definitely had his faults. Yes. Like he was a flawed man. Very much so. But in this moment, this is the moment that really explains a lot about. And we do kind of learn this happened later. Yeah. But it's really important, I think. And it sucks that we missed it now. Yeah. Because he then asks Severus if he's prepared to do what he must do. And Severus actually pales. For being as pale as he already is, the fucking vampire, he actually pales. <laughs> right. And he says that he is. And he leaves. Yeah. And we don't specifically know what he was asked to do, but we also we know guess. what he was yeah, asked to know. do. We can fill in the blanks. And that's pretty just... Pretty easily. Oh, it's such a huge setup. It's that moment where Snape waited. He showed his loyalty to Dumbledore. And then he was able to spin it. And we'll get to talk a lot more about that later, obviously. Quite a bit later. Not in the movie, but yeah, later. <laughs> Later in the series. Give us a few years, probably. Right. But this was just that little seedling. But anyway, Dumbledore is like, all right, I sent everybody else off on their tasks. Now I have to go be a headmaster and talk to the Diggories. So, Harry, you need to take the rest of your potion and get some sleep. He leaves. And Harry's just like, thank God they're all gone. Right? He just like (laughs) slumps back on his pillow like, thank God. Mm Mm-hmm. Everybody that's left is silent for a moment. And Mrs. Weasley picks up the potion to give to Harry and nudges the bag of gold in the process and just like, distract yourself. Think about what you want to buy with your winnings. Mm -hmm. And Harry's just like, I don't want those fucking winnings. Yeah. Like that should have been Cedric's money. And Mrs. Weasley's like, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. And Harry tears Mm -hmm. up and is just like, I'm the one who told him to take the cup with me. That doesn't mean it's your fault, baby. I know. And that's exactly what Mrs. Weasley says, because she sets the goblet back down and just gives him the first mother's hug that he can ever remember getting. Yeah. The mama bear hug. And Harry, like, basically tears up. And he, like, has to screw up his face because everything is just fighting to get out. Like, he is just about to cry everything that happened. Mm-hmm. And they are then interrupted. Talk about a mood killer. <laughs> a loud slamming sound and everybody like jumps mrs leasley and harry break apart and they look over at hermione who's just like clutching something very tightly in her hands by the window <laughs> just like oops sorry oh my bad guy i'll explain later uh, <laughs> continue on <laughs> go back to your hug it looked very nice instead mrs weasley gives him the potion and harry swallows it in one gulp and immediately falls back asleep oh. And that's where the chapter ends. And can we just talk about 
that moment with Hermione and the loud slam and how we're going to find out next week what that was and why we didn't get to have this happen. We didn't get it in the movie. Oh, we didn't so get it. infuriating. I was so looking forward to that, too. I know. I really wanted to see it. I just wanted to see how they made her her look i i, I just, I, I, nah, I just I wanted, wanted to see, see it all of it oh we'll talk more about it next week yes when it's actually revealed mm. but again no movie scenes no actors yep even if there were i think we're good on all of our actors anyway yeah we're pretty well done with that until we start the next one which we're getting closer and closer to oh thank god but for now our potter pondering which is, how do you feel about the movie leaving out basically everything from chapter 36? Everything. I know Ashley's going to have a good rant for us. Oh, I look forward to her rants every time. Right. And then Jackson's accent and Carly's adorableness. Mm -hmm. And all of our other keepers that we have yet to hear from. Y'all need to give us a call. We get some randoms every now and then. Some other people will call or send one in. And I love it. Guys, it's literally the highlight of me editing the episodes is getting to hear your voices and your reactions. So please, mm -hmm. even if you hate your voice, Mike Riley, just call us and let <laughs> us hear it. I guarantee you, even if you hate your voice, I guarantee you we do not. Right? We love it. And there is a button on the episode that skips forward 30 seconds. So if you don't want to hear your response, just tap that, move past it. Yeah. But let us enjoy you. <laughs> I'm I'm going to go with that. You know what I mean. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean, <laughs> Ellen. Anywho, find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Once again, we really look forward to reading and hearing them. This will bring us to our sorting hat story, which is from Lori Shearer Seaton. She writes, I'm Slytherin. I don't know my wand, but my Patronus is a butterfly. I bought the books for my kids when each one came out. We started reading them together, but the kids went off to do other things, and I kept reading. I remember taking them to see the Sorcerer's Stone and was so entranced that they had brought the book to life in such detail. I never collected anything but the books and the DVDs as they came out. I actually didn't finish reading them and had only seen the first three movies because I was too busy raising my kids and working. Now my kids are grown up and I now have grandchildren. About three years ago we went to London and one of the families on our tour group had arrived several days earlier so they could do all of the Harry Potter tours and see everything they could. I bought my granddaughter a wand from the train station, but that was about it. Then, on the 10-hour plane ride home, I started over reading the books on my Kindle. I had bought the whole series months before, but never got around to reading them. I continued reading it once we were home, and then watched all of the movies, and fell in love once again with the magic of it all. I found half of a bookend set in the thrift store for $1.98. I found the other half on eBay for $25, and that was the beginning of my avid serious collecting. I am 55. The magic has no age limit. I have a full room of Harry Potter. I have all of the first edition hardcovers that I bought for my kids and have all but two Bloomsbury first editions. It's hard to describe what all I have because there is so much. We had some damage from Hurricane Ida, so I had to move everything out of the room to have the roof and ceiling repaired, but luckily all of my treasures were safe. Whew! I was worried there for a second when she mentioned the hurricane. Right? Man. I'm glad her treasures and herself was safe. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Lori. Yes, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is... What curse did Harry cast on Crab when he, Malfoy, and Goyle showed up in their train compartment on their way home? The first one who responds with a correct answer in the code word hashtag odd will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast 
and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we cover the final chapter of Goblet of Fire, Chapter 37, The Beginning, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.